We've, uh, we've spent the past two weeks now in, in the book of Ruth in this series, Walking with God, Walking with Others, where we've been thinking about what it looks like to do uh, just that. What does it look like for us to learn from this example of this young woman as we think about what does it look like now in our lives today to walk with God, to walk with others? Uh, and this morning, we're going to continue with that theme, with that focus, with, with some special attention to what does it look like for us to be generous in that walk? What does it look like for us to live generously in the midst of that walk? And one of the things that makes uh, this morning special is that I don't, I'm not preaching alone, which I don't want to leave, leave room for applause. I don't know how that's going to go, but I'm not preaching alone. You don't have to listen to me for 35 minutes. Um, yeah, there. Yeah. Who was it? Billy, yeah, of course, sounds accurate, okay. Um, but I'm actually preaching with Jenna Everson, who's our, our high school ministry intern. Yeah, wait, where was the applause for me, Nicole? When I was, oh, okay, I see how, thanks, Greg. But uh, Jenna has been interning here for a little over a year now. Uh, she was a, a health sciences major at Azusa Pacific University when she realized God was calling her into something different. And so uh, she changed her major from health sciences to, to Christian ministries. And I'm sure many of you have encouraged your children or your grandchildren not to change their majors, okay, at various points in time. She did it, and it worked out great. So maybe this can be reassuring for you. But she changed her major uh, to Christian ministry. She added a second major of, of biblical studies, um, and she ended up graduating basically at the top of her class. She's really embarrassed about this, but she got two academic awards, okay, outstanding senior in Christian ministries, outstanding senior in biblical studies, which is a stark contrast between our two uh, academic careers on that front. But um, she's, she's been awesome, and so she's been interning a little over a year with us now. She's a student of the crowd and of the rock, and it's been fun to just see someone here at Beach Point who, who had a plan for their life, heard God calling them into something different, and they were willing to, uh, to, to follow through with that, to follow through in that moment. And so, um, Jenna, you can, you can make your way on up here. We're going to get started in a second. But uh, this morning, what we're going to do is we're going to kind of go back and forth uh, and share the mic a little bit, not the literal mic because they're on our faces, but we're going to share the podium a little bit. Um, and then we'll, we'll kind of finish out with a, a lovely duet for all of you here at the end, so there you go. Sweet, hello, good morning, everyone. Um, even though it embarrassed me a little bit, uh, Justin said some very nice things, and one of those things is definitely true, which is that I am a youth group kid. Uh, I went to the crowd here, I went to the rock, and now I'm a rock leader as well, and the intern, <laughs> shout out rock. Um, and maybe if you've been around the church block a couple times, you're like me, and you start to guess the endings of sermons. And part of this is because it's how our mind works. Our brain is hardwired to fill in the gaps quickly and efficiently so that we don't have to waste resources where we don't need to. Because this is how our minds can work, here's my warning to you up top. Don't guess the ending. Don't tune out. Don't assume you know where the sermon is going. Because this is how our minds can work, this is my warning to you. And maybe it's also my youth ministry brain. I'm trying to get your attention. Maybe it's because I love to guess the endings, but please, stay dialed in. And there's two reasons why I'm worried about you tuning out and guessing the ending. The first is that we're reading Ruth, Ruth 2, which is where Boaz and Ruth meet. But please don't assume you know how the story goes. Listen with curious minds and a heart that is full of wonder. And the second reason that I'm worried about you tuning out is that we're going to be just discussing the call to care generously for other people. Don't guess what caring looks like. Don't settle for the definition of caring generously that you currently have. Don't fill in the blanks. And here's where we're picking up today in the story of Ruth. Ruth has just come with Naomi. They're in Bethlehem. Ruth has chosen to leave her home country to a land she's never known. Naomi has just asked to be called Mara, which means bitterness. Naomi is hurting. Ruth is committed to her. They've come to Bethlehem. And then we pick up here today, Ruth 2, verse 1. Now Naomi had a relative on her husband's side, a man of standing from the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. 
Naomi said to her, go ahead, my daughter. So she went out, entered a field, and began to glean behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. And this is the introduction to the story that we get. We, as the reader, learn a lot. Elimelech, who was Naomi's husband, has a relative in Bethlehem. Now here's a little trick when it comes to reading the Old Testament. If someone is described, we need to pay attention. Direct descriptions and characterizations are not common, so if the narrator tells you something, you have to listen. So here we are. The writer makes sure to mention that Boaz is Mr. Well-to-do. The story opens. Our Mr. Sheffield, our Mr. Darcy, our insert prominent here is in this town. Not only that, He's connected to these women. He's connected to these women. This information is stirring in the back of your minds when Ruth says to Naomi, let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. And to our modern ears, this sounds a bit odd. Why is Ruth going to go rummage around in some random field? Why is Naomi letting her rummage around in some random field? This can feel like such a distant reality from what we have today. It's kind of hard to picture. This is where I like checking in with the artists. Look at this painting titled The Gleaners by Millet, and this is one picture of gleaning. This is what Ruth has set out to do. Gleaning is this practice from Israelite law in which the edges of the field are left for those who need to harvest. For those in need to harvest, one commentary says it this way, gleaning is a primary means of support for the destitute prescribed in the Israelite law. Gleaning supports the destitute. There are a handful of verses that the scripture draws from, but hear this from Leviticus 19, verses 9 through 10. When you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Do not go over your vineyard a second time or pick up the grapes that have fallen. Leave them to the poor and the foreigner. I am the Lord your God. See, when you harvested whatever it was that you were growing, you were supposed to intentionally leave margin. You were supposed to leave this margin. Gleaning was this practice of being able to scoop up that which was left on the edges, assuming that the farmers knew they were supposed to leave the food on the edges. And this law intentionally made space for others. And so I love this, the, the, pic, the painting that Jenna chose here, because I think it's this perfect contrast for us uh, of so often we have this image of the law, right? This image of the law in the Old Testament as being harsh uh, and rigid, right? It, it left little room for mercy or for grace or for, for kindness in general. And, and yet the laws surrounding leaning actually paint a, a very different picture. They, they present a picture of the law as caring deeply for people, as protecting people, as an effort to care for those who, who are vulnerable. Uh, and, and what we see is that the law wasn't just codes for like whose hands to cut off for what offenses, right? There was also this, this deep commitment to, to seeing these people who were in need cared for, this deep commitment uh, to how to care for people, to generously care for people. And, and gleaning was just one of those practices. Also relevant to Ruth is that the law provided special protections to people who fell into all sorts of different groups of people. And you see it throughout the law over and over again, protections for the widow, the foreigner, the alien, and for the orphan. Exodus 22, um, 22 through 24, gives us a really nice picture of some of those protections with a uh, like side helping of the, the hand cutting off portion of the Old Testament. We'll see here in a second. But this is what it says. It says, do not take advantage of the widow or the fatherless. If you do, and they cry out to me, I will certainly hear their cry, right? So there's the protections. And then he says, my anger will be aroused and I will kill you with the sword. Your wives will become widows and your children fatherless. Okay, that's I think what we mostly expect from the law there at the end of that one. But uh, we see here this commitment to these people that, that they're the widow and the fatherless, these are people to be protected. Deuteronomy 10 says that God gives special protection under the law to the fatherless, to the widow, to the alien. Deuteronomy 14 sets aside the tithes of every third year to care for the fatherless, the sojourner, the traveler among you. 
Deuteronomy 24 calls, says that justice should not be perverted for the widow, the fatherless, the orphan, the traveler. Deuteronomy 24 also ends up reaffirming the gleaning laws from Leviticus 19. And so when Ruth went out into Boaz's field and started gleaning, when Ruth went out into this field in this moment, she knew that she fell into this protected class of people. And not just one of these groups, right? She actually, like, she could check every single box on the way down, right? She, her husband had died in Moab, leaving her a widow, uh, her father-in-law, Elimelech, had died. She has no family with her here besides Naomi, effectively making her uh, an orphan. She's at, left her homeland in Moab and come to move into Bethlehem, making her a, a, a sojourner, a traveler uh, in this land. She literally checks every single box in the law of these people who are protected. And so what we get, this sort of um, silver lining to the story is, is that Ruth seems to be aware of these laws. She seems to be aware of her status in this moment. She seems to know, as we're gonna see in a second, that, that God knew she should be protected, that God was going to protect her and provide for her. And Boaz, who we're about to see in verse four, seems to know this too. And so we pick up here in verse four as Ruth is out in the field gleaning. And it says this, just then Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you, they answered. Boaz asked the overseer of his harvesters, who does that young woman belong to? The overseer replied, she is the Moabite who came back from Moab with Naomi. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. She came into the field and has remained here from morning till now, except for a short rest in the shelter. Right, and so we see for a moment here, Boaz checks on his field. He arrived there and he finds Ruth is gleaning in the fields and he gets the rundown from his workers. Who, are the, who is this woman? Why is she here? What's going on? And they give him the rundown here, all these details. And, and you start to see in this next moment that he's piecing together, he's pieced together a little bit of, of what is owed to Ruth, a little bit of what Ruth requires, what, what he's supposed to do in this moment. It says, so Boaz said to Ruth, my daughter, Listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field and don't go away from here. Stay here with the women who work for me. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the women. I've told the men not to lay a hand on you. And whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars the men have filled. At this, she bowed down with her face to the ground. She asked him, why have I found such favor in your eyes that you notice me, a foreigner, right? She, she notes right there, her, the status that she has, that she's a foreigner in this land. And in verse 11, Boaz replied, I've been told all about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and mother and your homeland and came to live with a people you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Right, and this is this, really nice prayer, and Bo, or Ruth responds in a kind of interesting way in verse 13. She says, may I continue to find favor in your eyes, my Lord, she said. You have put me at ease by speaking kindly to your servant, though I do not, be, do not have the standing of one of your servants. And Boaz offered this, this prayer over Ruth, that God would provide for her, that God would protect her, that God would reward her, God would repay her. That, that God would provide her refuge. It's this nice prayer that he offers in this moment. And Ruth responded to him, not with a, a thank you, but by saying, no, Boaz, you, would you provide for me? Would you be the refuge for me? Would you repay me? Would you reward me? She has this confidence in a way that, that God was going to do those things. God was going to make good on those, that prayer of Boaz, but he wasn't going to do it out of thin air, out of nothingness. That God was going to use Boaz to provide her with refuge, to support her. He was going to use Boaz in this way. That it would be through Boaz's faithfulness, through Boaz's support, through Boaz's generosity, that Ruth would be repaid and rewarded and she would find refuge. Refuge. 
which is why as we've been thinking about what it looks like for us to, to walk with God and, and to walk with others, we have to think about, and, and we think about generosity and what that looks like, we have to recognize that our call is to care generously for those that God has placed in our lives. That you have to think about, you have to recognize your call is to care generously for the people that God has placed in your life. There are real people that God has placed in your life to care for. And this book isn't about some abstract idea of God's blessings raining down on people. Right? It's not some, manna doesn't rain down from heaven on Ruth for her to collect and be provided for. God doesn't send quail to run through the camp for her to capture, to provide for her in this moment. No, Ruth would rely on Boaz's generosity in this moment. God would use Boaz's generosity in this moment to provide for Ruth, to provide that refuge and that support that she needed. And in the same way, there are people in our lives who could rely on us, who could rely on our generosity to see the way that God provides them support and refuge and the things they need in life. And if we're gonna be people who walk with God and then walk, and walk with others, we should expect to be presented with more and more opportunities to, to care generously uh, for these people, for the people who God has placed in our lives. And you can take over, Jenna. Okay, thank, thank, thanks. These opportunities to care generously for others placed in our lives, it's there because caring has precedent. Jesus is always encouraging his followers and therefore us to care generously. This is the thread we see in the book of Ruth. This thread is woven through all of scripture because it is the same thread that runs through God's own heart. The same God who knit us together in our mother's womb does so with the same thread of generous love that is woven throughout all of scripture. It is the outpouring of God's own heart. And one instance instance of this call to care generously is in Luke's gospel. In the gospel of Luke, we have the story of the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan is a story that Jesus tells to help demonstrate who is one's neighbor. In the story, the Samaritan doesn't just cover the Levite's night at the end. He tells the innkeeper to look after him, and any expense he needs, he will reimburse. The Samaritan is highlighted as the neighbor in the story, He is the one highlighted as the one who cared generously. When we hear stories like this, they stick with us. Something feels right in the world when we hear stories about people caring generously for one another. Something sets moments like these apart. Something clicks. I would be inclined to call this moment evidence of living within God's purposes. From the beginning until now, God's intentions have been clear. We are called to care generously for one another. Care generously and not decently. When we care decently, it means we did a pretty good job. It means I was kind enough, thoughtful enough, giving enough. From all outside perspectives, decency would not raise any eyebrows or cause anyone to see me as cruel. And yet intriguingly, about halfway through this chapter, the tension between Boaz and Ruth peaks. Jump back to verse 12 with me when Boaz says, may the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Boaz wishes over Ruth that she finds reward from God. Like Justin said, he tells Ruth, I'll be praying that God continues to bless you, that God continues to provide. That is a decent prayer. And I I do believe that he really meant it and he wanted that for her. But look how Ruth responds in verse 13. May I continue to find favor in your eyes, my Lord. Ruth sees Boaz as God's redeemer. Ruth rightly pushes back the kind platitudes of Boaz, it's a tension between Boaz's words of, may the Lord bless you, and Ruth's, may you continue to bless me. 
Ruth knows who she is in Bethlehem. She knows she's a member of every protected class that is entitled to Israelite generosity. God has instructed his people to care generously for the marginalized. Ruth knows this. She knows this. And we know that Ruth knows this because she brought up gleaning. Naomi didn't tell her to go glean. She did it. Ruth knows what she deserves as a member of these marginalized groups. Boaz cared for her decently and was set to follow a path of decent caring when Ruth gives a resounding no. No, she knows that Boaz is the one who's supposed to be the agent of God's care. She knows this. Boaz is an upstanding member of his community. Literally, his name Boaz means pillar. He's the pillar of the community. He's well-respected, and he has the means for blessing Ruth. Boaz knows who Ruth is on two levels. Earlier in the chapter, Boaz gets the rundown. He learns that she has come alone, only with her mother-in-law, to a new place. She's lost her father-in-law. She's lost her husband. And this time, if a male in her family died before he and his wife had children, it was customary for a relative of her husband to marry her. And we'll look at that in a couple minutes. And in a time where family meant protection and safety, marrying again to a family you already knew was a way to protect a vulnerable widow. Boaz knows Ruth is a part of this marginalized group that he is supposed to care for as an Israelite community member. And yet on another level, Boaz is absolutely obligated to care for Ruth, even before she knows it. Back in verse five, he asks, who does this woman belong to? Again, weird question for our ears. If someone asked me that question, they would get a very spirited no one but myself. Thank you very much. They were sadly in a male-run society where it was his role to figure out who her husband and who her father were. And this question could be rephrased to say, what man is supposed to be taking care of her? Then we get one of my favorite things of all time, Hebrew irony. Because as we the reader know, and what Ruth will eventually learn, Boaz is the one who's supposed to be taking care of her. Boaz is the male family member that is supposed to be taking care of Ruth. Hebrew irony. Ruth knows who she is, but she also doesn't know yet. She knows what she deserves, but she doesn't know that she deserves even better care because he's Elimelech's relative. She pushes on Boaz because she knows that God asks of him what God asks of him as an Israelite caring for the community. She pushes because he's the only delivering decently and not generously. The narrator is doubling it down and making it very clear that Ruth is right to call for extra care. Ruth's, Boaz's decent caring should be generous caring. And the exciting thing that emerges from this is that Boaz grows a little bit from her pushback. But I don't think he entirely gets the picture quite yet. Hop back in the text to verse 14. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, come over here, have some bread and dip it in the wine vinegar. When she sat down with the harvesters, he offered her some roasted grain. She ate all she wanted and had some left over. As she got up to glean, Boaz gave orders to his men, let her gather from among the sheaves and don't reprimand her. Even pull out some stalks for her from the bundles and leave them for her to pick up and don't rebuke her. So Ruth gleaned in the field until evening. Then she threshed the barley she had gathered and it amounted to about an ephah. She is invited a bit closer. She is treated kinder than an average gleaner. She is given extra. Boaz is moving away from decent. But has he made the full jump to grand generosity? He gives her an ephah of barley. Whoa! I don't know how much you guys deal with barley, but I don't at all. So we decided we needed to look up what this was. Justin and I scanned the ancient Near Eastern food converters. Commentaries and Google searches were cascading across the office. And from our best estimates, we're looking at here an ephah of barley equating to $5 to $20 worth of food. This was more than what a gleaner would typically get. It could have been what someone would have collected in 10 to 30 days of work. 
Boaz is growing in his moves of generosity, but it's not grand generosity. By allowing the workers to leave more margin, it was not a meaningless offer. It was entirely decent. He opened himself up to a completely rational amount to give Ruth. It is enough. It is a decent amount. It, it gets the job done. And the challenge for us is that the, the call on our lives, I don't think, is a call by God to, to care decently for people, right? It's a call that God makes on our lives to care generously for people. We're not supposed to be defined, at least in part, by our decent care for others, but by our generous care for others, our generous love and care for others around us. Think back to the, the Sermon on the Mount for a second when Jesus uh, talks about an eye for an eye, right? And he says this in Matthew 5, starting in verse 40, he says, and if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. And that's a radical call to generosity, right? That's a radical call to be generous in our lives. If someone wants to sue you and take your coat, offer them, or your shirt, offer them your coat too, right? This is a, a radical call to be not just care decently for people, to be generous to people. And I, I personally, I really do wish that wasn't the case sometimes, right? I wish the call in our lives was a call to be decent people, that people would look at us and say, oh, they're decent was good enough, right? I would be happy if people looked at me and they said, oh, Justin, he's decent. Usually I would take that, okay? That's a win in my book most of the time. And yet the, the call isn't to be decent. The call is to be generous, to have this sort of radical generosity, and that's difficult because it leaves less for me. It requires more of me. It requires a lot more of me, and yet over and over again throughout Scripture, we see that the call isn't to just be decent, but to be generous, it's not to just meet what's expected of us, but to exceed that. And that's what it's going to look like if we're people who walk with God and walk with others, that this radical call to generosity in our life is going to be placed on us. That there's something for us here. And the story goes on in verse 18, right? That, that Ruth has this ephah of barley and she goes back now and it says she carried it back to town and her mother-in-law saw how much she had gathered. Ruth also brought out and gave her what she had left over after she had eaten enough. Her mother-in-law asked her, where did you glean today? Where did you work? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. Then Ruth told her mother-in-law about the one at whose place she had been working. The name of the man I worked with today is Boaz, she said. The Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. He has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. She added, that man is our close relative. He is one of our guardian redeemers. Then Ruth the Moabite said, he even said to me, stay with my workers until they finish harvesting all my grain. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it will be good for you, my daughter, to go with the women who work for him because in someone else's field you might be harmed. So Ruth stayed close to the women of Boaz to glean until the barley and wheat harvests were finished and she lived with her mother-in-law. The, the author, the narrator here is setting up the, the character development for the rest of the, the book of Ruth for the next two chapters. This is really the setup for chapter three, which we're going to see in the next two weeks. And so here we have Naomi telling Ruth that Boaz was their guardian redeemer. And Boaz is aware of this most likely, or he knows that there's an expectation being relatives of them that this could be the case, but it's building this tension it's building this tension for the next couple chapters where we know that Boaz is supposed to do something for Ruth and Naomi, and the characters haven't quite figured it out yet. But it's important for us to see this guardian redeemer note to understand what this is because it's going to be relevant for the rest of the series. Um, and if you really want to see poor, poor Bill twist himself into like a pretzel, um, be here like the next two Sundays to watch him go through Ruth chapter three because it is maybe the most awkward chapter in the Bible and Bill's going to do it in two weeks. So uh, be here. I'll bring the popcorn. It'll be a great time. But uh, we have to, un to understand that the next couple weeks uh, of Ruth, we have to understand this guardian redeemer point, what, what this is. And, and the idea is that it was a, a legal term at the time uh, for someone who had an obligation to care for these people, 
that Boaz had a legal obligation to care for Ruth, to care for Naomi, to provide for them because he was a close relative of theirs, because he was related to Elimelech, to Ruth's father-in-law, that this was an obligation he had, that he was there, you know, the guardian redeemer would have been expected to buy back the land that had been sold at some point in a, a family crisis or to buy back the family members who'd been sold into slavery because they had, didn't have enough money, or he would be expected to uh, provide a, a dead brother with an heir to, for their family, or um, they would be expected to avenge the killing of a relative to care for their family members in dirt, difficult circumstances. This was the expectation of the guardian redeemer. And what we see here is that Boaz is one of the guardian redeemers of Ruth and of Naomi that he's her guardian redeemer. He is obligated in this way to help her in this moment and in the moments to come. And it's so tempting for us, I think, when we read a, a book like Ruth, a story like Ruth, to want to see Ruth in ourselves, to want to see ourselves in Ruth. I mean, she, from a narrative perspective, she's the main character of the story, right? The book is named after her. We want that to be us. But I think the reality more often than not is that we probably would have better luck seeing ourselves in Boaz and seeing Boaz in ourselves. That doesn't mean that, that we've got life figured out. It doesn't mean that we have the, everything secure. It doesn't mean that all of our needs have been met or anything like that. But it does mean that there, there are people in our lives. There are people in our lives who God has placed in our lives that, that we have an obligation to care generously for. That there are people that God has placed in our lives that we are obligated by this call to live generously, to care for, to support. Just like in the case of the Good Samaritan, right, there are people around us who are neighbors who are within our reach, who God has called us to, to live this generous life for. And oftentimes you'd hear us talk about here at Beach Point this idea of eight to 15, right? The eight to 15 people who God has strategically and supernaturally placed in your life. These people who have a, a front row seat to your life in a way. You know, these might be your, your friends. These might be, uh, these might be your siblings, your family. They might be your classmates or your kids, teammates, parents. These are people that your boss, your coworkers, people that are in your life whether you like it or not sometimes. They're the people who you interact with most commonly, who you can put together a list and say, these are the people at the core of my life. And God gives you opportunities to care for them, to care for them generously, in fact, not just decently, not to do what is decent of you, but to be generous with them, with the people in your lives. And to do that, though, to do that, you have to start somewhere. I'm sure we've all tried to start a project or or do something in our lives. Maybe it was a a New Year's resolution where you had a goal in mind and you tried to go from zero to 100 all at once and you failed because you tried to, to skip all the steps in between. We've got to start somewhere. We have to start with something. And for us, I think this morning, it's easy for us to to look to Boaz in the example he started with, because Jenna, I think, so rightly noted, Boaz grows in chapter two. He gets a little closer to where he's supposed to be, and there's more growth to come in the rest of the book. And so we can look to where Boaz starts and start there ourselves. And Boaz started by leaving margin on his field for people to glean from. He followed the law. He started with what was expected of him, which was that he would leave margin on the edge of his field that he wouldn't harvest so that people like Ruth could come and glean from the field. That's not the end goal for, for Boaz. He gets somewhere else. But in that same sort of way, we have to think about how can we leave margin in our lives for the people to glean from them? How can we leave margin in our lives so that the people in our eight to 15 can glean from them? And I wanna challenge you to think about it even specifically to this week. Right? Don't, don't have some big grand vision of how the next year is going to go. But what could you do this week to create some margin so that the people in your eight to 15, the people you have, that God has placed in your life can glean something from your life? How can you create margin in your time 
this week so that someone can glean some of that time away from you. And time is difficult to give up sometimes. It's difficult for us to give up our time when, when the reality is you can't get more of it, right? There's always a limited amount of time. You can't earn more time. And yet I've found so often that, that the most impactful moments that, that I've had in my life, in my ministry, have often come when I've just been willing to let someone glean some time away from me. That I can sit with them even when it's difficult for me. And so many of us, we schedule our lives right to the mark, not, not to the margin, we schedule it all the way, right? The whole field, all of our time, all of our lives, all of our kids' lives are scheduled to the very edge. And there's nothing left for anyone else to lean away. And if we schedule our lives that way to the edge, we've scheduled our lives to a point that we can no longer be generous with our time. We also wanna think about how can you create margin in your talents this week? You all have gifts and abilities. I know that, I've seen so many of them. How can you create space to use those gifts and abilities for others and your talents? They're gonna love this, but Greg and Mary Keenan, I think, are excellent examples of this. You probably saw Greg's face up here earlier with his selfie on the, uh, the board, but uh, Greg and Mary are, are very generous with their talents. Mary was an accountant, is an accountant. Greg, I had to ask him again. I was like, I don't know what you do. It does construction something. But he said he was a construction superintendent. And yet, they are so generous with their talents. Mary has saved me probably $10,000 that I would have owed the IRS six times if it wasn't for Mary, okay? Greg is here more often than I am making sure that the property is taken care of, that things are getting repaired, that the building works, okay? They're so generous with their talents because they create that space, that margin in their life to use their talents for others. How can you use your gifts for them, for others, for the people in your eight to 15? How can you use your, how can you allow people to glean from your finances? How can you give, how can you live a life that creates margin so that people can, can glean from your finances, from your treasure in life? How can you leave margin for people in this way? And so this morning, what I wanna do as we end is to, we're gonna share in communion together, as Mitch said in a moment. And I think it's a perfect end for us this morning because it's a moment for us to be reminded, right, in Jesus' final days with his disciples, he, he shared communion with them. And it serves as this reminder of the generosity of God, that God hasn't cared decently for us, but generously that God loves us generously, that he poured out everything for us generously. And it says that on his last days, Jesus took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. And so today, what I wanna invite you to do is we come together and we take communion together is to think about the generosity of God the way that Jesus cared generously for you. And to even take a moment and ask Jesus as you come to the table this morning, how can I care generously for the people in my life in that same way? And so when you're ready, eat and drink in remembrance of him.